is called the Ari law or the Ara law. And the reason it's called the Ara law is that there was no word that I could pull from the collective memory of, and I'm going to use this description, of how white men have interpreted the history of the society that claimed not just uh, the land in terms of Australia, but was right throughout Southeast Asia and, and connected to the other Polynesian cultures as well. So the word Ari or Ara is used because it is a fundamental word that is present throughout all the different tribes as a unity. Uh, because I could not find a word that could uh, unify in terms of using the word dream or dream time or the word spirit because they've divided and conquered and what they've done deliberately is that they've misspelt them because there are differences in terms of, uh, you know, we, we, we talk about writing. But I'm referring to a system of law that existed in what we call Australia for tens of thousands of years that predates any kind of law like common law by tens of thousands of years and yet was a complex, organized system of law. So what I'm saying is, and what I hope you will help with, is making sure that the canons of law, the canons of positive law, recognize a truth and heal the history. That when it comes to a place like Australia, as it comes to a place like Africa, as it comes to a place like the Americas, North, South and, and Central America, that the indigenous systems of law existed. They were comprehensive they were enforced and honoured and that we are not dealing with places that did not understand law. You follow? Yep. Okay. So I look forward to being able to pass uh, this by you over, over the coming uh, few days and the coming week. You've got my email. Send me an email. We'd love to talk with you. But these are the kind of things that lay the groundwork for the communities. When the law is restored and when the honour of the law is restored, then everything can cascade through that. All righty? Thanks very much. All right. Talk to you soon. Got to keep going, but thank you, and I'll talk to you soon. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go down to Alpha 99, and then I look forward to, um, to covering... Uh, any more people who want to speak? Uh, any more questions people have? Okay, here we go. Alpha 99. Can you hear us? Alpha 99. Yeah. Hi, Frank. Brian here. Hi. Yeah, how are you doing? Good. Um, I'm. My question, i got sort of a two-part two question here. Um, when you're talking about your currencies um, and negotiable instruments, and you notice uh, you mentioned Canon 957 um, interacting our currency that to some extent with the current system. My main main, main question is how could a Ukadia currency and belonging to it strengthen our position in claiming unused land, or, or would we record um, our claim of land in U Ukadia system? That's basically my question. Yeah, absolutely. It comes to, the, comes to the heart of the Roman concept of occupation. So what the Roman concept of occupation did, and this goes back to pagan Rome, is that they overlaid a system on top of an ancient right of possession. So under the ancient rule of possession, if you found a piece of unclaimed land, you could possess it by living on it, and then it became yours because you possessed it and also you took care of it. There were rules for taking care of it. And back to the old rules of Tara, which was literally called law of the land, Tara, Terra, land, law of the land, that uh, you had to maintain that land. You couldn't just simply go and possess land and do nothing with it. You had to actually maintain it. What the Romans did was when they uh, conquered an area, they wanted to uh, usurp 
the whole ancient rights, the Celtic rights of, of possession. Uh, and that's what they did. The way they did it was that they created a written register. And then what they said was ownership no longer simply meant that you possessed it. You had rights of possession and they accepted that. You had rights of possession. And under rights of possession, they said you had a thing called usufruct. That's the fruits of use or the rights of the, to, to, to consume the fruits of the, of the land. But ownership was called occupation. And occupation was to be a record in the register. Now, the only people who could have a record in the register were Roman citizens, so they disenfranchised people. And secondly, it was first in best dressed. In other words, uh, you could have, could have possessed a piece of land for 30 years, you could have laid a claim, someone comes along, they update the land title system, and it's first in best dress, someone else comes along and says, I own that land, they get their name up there under the Roman system, they own it. So what I'm saying is, under the Roman system, it's not good enough simply to uh, stake a claim anymore. You need to prove that your title, which is merely a record in a register, your title is perfected and, and superior to anyone else. And because the Eucadia register is a superior register, once your land is recorded and it can be publicly searched and is managed properly, then you have superior title. You follow? Yeah, and that that could uh, obviously you could uh, in a situation you could have a, you know somebody challenging your reason for being on the land, knock your buildings down, do whatever that you wanted to do on this unused the current unused land. That would that would be part of something you could take in to defend yourself or whatever if you're dragged into Correct. their court Correct. system. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, okay. Well, that's and, that's uh, a good question. Good. And look, the, the other thing about that is, too, is the understanding of, of uh, what is enclosed land and what is sacred land. And that's another thing we describe in the notes, uh, How to Save Your Home. So, look, I'll leave it at that, but yep. you had another part. Was that the first question? or that That's it. Just the only other part of it was the, the you know, you, you mentioned that um, in, with the currencies, the negotiable instruments that are, um, you know, we could take them into a bank, not that it would get us anywhere at first, but you know they they would be doing they would be uh, uh, being being a dishonor by not accepting them. Yeah, well, I think I think right. the the reality is of the system, and I think we have to accept this is that mental illness and mental illness uh -huh. knows no bounds. I mean, there's plenty of people who um, are mentally ill because they're sarcastic. I mean, you'll talk about things that are very real, and they'll be sarcastic. You know, we've got people typing stuff in here. In the chat window, there's a guy here making sarcastic comments in the chat window. You can't account for mental illness. It's, it's, it's everywhere. Um, and because of mental illness, the you know, mental illness means that these people just refuse to yield. So I think the, the argument when we do what we're doing isn't because uh, necessarily we'll get effect. But when, when change comes, and change is going to come, it is coming. When change comes and we talk about claim, we can go back and say, on this date we did this and you dishonoured. On this date we did this and you dishonoured. On this date we did this. And no one can argue that it did not occur. Yeah? Right. So, so notorial procedure is, is not simply about doing it and hoping it will win. It's about doing it and recognising that history requires you to do the right thing. And it may be a year, it may be two, it may be 10 years before the banker families are strung up by their necks. But the way they're going that day, that destiny awaits them because they refuse to yield. When it happens, everything we've done will be to validate uh, the transition. So, yeah, you can try with a bank, but at this stage, most banks will probably laugh and ignore you. Yeah, All right. I would expect that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for your thanks for your answer there. Okay. Good on you. Bye. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Uh, I see there's some more questions here, and if anyone wants to talk live, please uh, type star eight. I think it is star eight, and we'd love to to hear from you. Uh, there's a couple of questions here. 
that I want to get to that we missed, uh, and I'll try and keep my answers short. <laughs> um, uh, guess what says, I have a court case when I said I was entrusted with the, the name first, middle name, uh, uh, did act out of honour. Um, guess for, I need, oh, here we go. The judge made a plea for me of not guilty. I say I don't consent. He said a trial date. Can a judge do that? Um, uh, no. No, what's happened is um, what the judge, what the judge uh, does and this happens uh, time and time again, is that the uh, judges will uh, run over you on the presumption that uh, you will not uh, challenge that at the end. And at the end, when you acquiesce, all the uh, failures of due process that they did will be obviated, will be forgiven. Uh, let me explain. The judge uh, in their system is pretty much given a, a wide berth to behave as a tyrant. And the only time that you can really um, hold the judge truly to account in terms of enforcement is when the uh, case has reached a point um, of either requiring your consent to, to perfect uh, or that it is moved to a, a stage where you have the opportunity to, to challenge an appeal. The only time that you really have any chance to make an impact in their system, and this is something that we keep learning more and more, so I'm sorry it's an evolving process as opposed to knowledge that I can have been able to share with you from day one. It's something that's evolving. And that is at the beginning, we have the opportunity to lay into the record documents where we can hold a judge to account or a magistrate to account at the end. Documents like under their own standing orders, they are required to act under their oath. They don't, but they're required to. So we can put that in, their own rules in terms of their uh, requirement to, to operate under their oath. We can put into the record uh, the right in many jurisdictions of elocution, that is the right to express and to put onto the record those things that were ignored. This is the time after a verdict is rendered and before a judgment is um, given. So that window there is an opportunity called uh, to speak elocution. We can include in that um, our live-born record and that we uh, decline uh, to um, consent to their jurisdiction, in which case jurisdiction is challenged. We challenge their jurisdiction because we hold higher title. We can put that into the record. So we can put these key things into the record and Ron Davenport has produced a document and some material that he's put onto University of Acadia that gives that background material where you can submit that into the record. And he, he's given some in guidance on how to go about that. And the other area, as I said, is at the end. But the middle, and the middle pretty much constitutes the first hearing right through to the trial, right through to the end. The middle is pretty much the judge running rampant. Now, if you give up, and unfortunately many, many people do, and that's what they do, they're bullies. If you give up, then effectively under their system, as perverse as it is, the judge is forgiven for all these actions. But if you don't give up, if you make sure the record reflects that you did not consent, you did not plead not guilty, you did not consent to the jurisdiction and you de demurred, or you did not consent, then, then you can uh, use that along with all the other points of failure of due process uh, at the end of the case. But yes, this is a normal process in their system and the judges are beginning away with it for years and years and years. So, guess for I hope that answered some of uh, the points you raised. Um, I'm going to answer one more question and then I'm going to go to East Pennsylvania. Um, okay, True Trust. Uh, what are the books you suggest to read, in what order, and where are they located on the site? 
Um, I'm, I always believe